We're looking now at uh, John chapter 14. This would be the second chapter in that section that we call the Upper Room Discourse in the context of the Passover meal. Uh, the last conversation that Jesus would have, the last opportunity to teach them before He would go to the cross. And uh, having just told them that that is where He is headed, uh, brought some concern uh, to them, obviously. And so Jesus, of course, sets His sight on bringing them comfort. So let's read a little bit of that in these first six verses. And by the way, we're only going to be looking at verses 1 through 3 this morning. We're going to look at verses 4 through 6 this evening. Jesus says, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How do we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Well, may the Lord bless um, this part of His Word uh, to encourage us uh, this morning. Now, I've already told you a little bit about what we were looking at last time. Uh, Last time, Jesus uh, revealed something to His disciples that they were unaware of up until that moment, that one of them was going to betray Him, and that would be Judas. Now, remember, He told them in advance so that when it actually happened, they would know that He is God. And not only them, but also us, that we would know as well. Now, one of the many ways that Jesus proves to us that He is who He claims to be is by doing something that only God can do. And of course, only God can tell the future because He's planned it. Uh, Nobody else really has that ability. But the Lord wants us to know who He is so that we will listen to Him so that we will trust Him, so that we will do what He says, and in doing what He says, we will be safe. In other words, He wants us to know for our own good, because uh, He loves us. Now, we also saw the reason why Judas would betray Him, and that was that Jesus might go to the cross. Now, Jesus was going to the cross for several reasons. As we saw last week, He was going to the cross to glorify His Father, to reveal His Father's justice because He is a righteous God who cannot overlook sin. That's why Jesus went to the cross. Someone had to die if God was going to show grace and mercy. And so Jesus goes to the cross to bring glory to His Father's justice, but He also goes to the cross to glorify His Father's grace because in sending His Son to the cross, He opened up the door of salvation as we know. Secondly, Jesus had to be betrayed so that Jesus would be glorified. That was His reward for sacrificing Himself, that He would be given a people and also power, all power and authority in heaven and earth to rule and overrule all things for their good, for our good. And then thirdly, we saw Jesus went to the cross in order that He might bring us to glory, which is where He is now turning in His conversation with His disciples. Now, think about this for a moment. Put yourself in the place of the disciples. You've just heard uh, all these things that Jesus has said. Certainly, what they've heard, at least on the surface, could not have been a welcome thing. Jesus was going to be betrayed by one of His own. He was going to die. Uh, Where He was going, they wouldn't be able to come with Him now, but they would come later. Peter was going to deny three times that he even knew them, or knew Jesus, and they would be left alone without Jesus in the world. Of course, Jesus is going to tell them a little bit later, he's going to send them the Holy Spirit, but at this point, they're not yet aware of that. Now, how are they going to bear up under all these things that that Jesus has just revealed to them? How are they going to bear up under all that difficulty? Well, Jesus now turns his thoughts to comforting them, to tell them it's going to be okay. 
He tells them three things, basically. First of all, that they should not worry, but trust. They should believe. Believe that God has all things in control. Believe that Jesus has all things in control. Secondly, that He is leaving to prepare a place for them in heaven. Those are very, very comforting words. And thirdly, that He will come again, and He will bring them to Himself. He will receive them in glory. Yes, it's one thing to prepare a place. It's another thing to actually get to where He is, but Jesus says He's going to come, and He's going to bring them. Now, again, remember, all these things also apply to us if we're trusting Jesus this morning. Now, first of all, Jesus tells them that they shouldn't worry, but believe. Believe that He and the Father are in control. He says in verse 1 of chapter 14, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Now, certainly there is a certain focus to what it is He's wanting them to believe, but we do, you know, it has to do with that immediate context. We do need to remember that the chapter breaks in, in Scripture were created by the translators, they were created by the printers of the Bible so that you and I and everybody since that time would be able to find passages in Scripture more easily. I mean, how are you, how are you going to find your way to John chapter 14 verse, you know, what, what's actually in this text if there's no chapter breaks and no verse breaks? You have to do a lot of searching. And sometimes it makes us think because there's a break here that there's some sort of a change in the environment or in the time frames, but this is the same time frame we were talking about before, the same event. There's no break between what Jesus just said to His disciples and what He is telling them now. They were troubled because Jesus was leaving. What are they going to do without Jesus? How were they going to carry on the work that Jesus had called them to do? How were they going to remain safe from the Jews? Now, when you stop and think about it, what Jesus was telling the disciples was essentially they were going to be left in the same situation that we find ourselves in today. Jesus finished His work almost 2,000 years ago, and now He is in heaven, and we are here upon earth. And He has called us and left us here to do the same work that He had called the disciples to and left them on earth to do. And as we look at the increasing hostility of the world against Christians and know that the Lord has called us to reach them, even as Jesus called His disciples to reach out to the Jews, not to mention all the other difficulties that we have to face in life, we can find ourselves in the same situation that they were in, troubled over everything that we do actually have to face as we're on our way to heaven. What should we do? Well, we need to do the same thing Jesus told His disciples. He says, believe in God, believe also in Me. Now, we know that there is a trusting that our Lord calls us to do, a trusting in the Father, a trusting in the Son for salvation. But there's also this kind of trust that believes that what, what Jesus and His Father are doing is actually best, to know that they have a plan, to know that they are working it together for good, and that, of course, what they're doing is the absolute best thing that can be done. Now, trusting them in this sense can make all the difference between having a heart full of anxiety over all the difficulties that we have to face in life, uh, you know, the things that we have as personal trials, whether they be physical or spiritual, whether they're outside of us or within us as well as the difficulties we have to face living the Christian life in the face of a world that hates Him. It can make all the difference between being burdened by anxiety over all those things or essentially having peace. If we actually trust the Lord, we can have, as we were reminded a couple weeks ago in that evening sermon by Jeff Thomas, we can have fullness of joy, the same kind of joy our Lord Jesus Christ had in all of the situations that He found Himself. I mean, there were times when He was ushered to the edge of a cliff to be thrown over, and then they were going to stone Him on top of that. Uh, there were many times that they sought to try to, to take Him you know, secretly and kill Him, and Jesus knew that. But in the middle of all those circumstances, He had peace, even as the disciples, when they were in prison and stood before kings and had to do 
you know, things that were very difficult, had joy and they had peace because they trusted the Lord, which is why Paul reminded us, be anxious for nothing. Now, Jesus, you know, of course, when He tells us not to be troubled and not to worry, isn't simply telling us that we should simply trust Him and that's all that's necessary, but in that trust, we are to act because it's in acting that we're usually most troubled because we're afraid of what's going to happen when we reach out to others. But Jesus tells us here that we should believe and act upon that belief. We should trust and do what He tells us and know that whatever happens to us is all in His will so that we really do not have to be afraid because nothing is going to happen to us outside of His will and we know that His will for us is good. And everything that happens to us, God will work together for good. And in our seeking to do what He has called us to do, we also know the Lord will use us to build up His kingdom. He will establish what we do to advance His kingdom. But of course, if we're always paralyzed by fear and anxiety, we will never actually step out and do what He has called us to do. And so Jesus says to His disciples, do not let your hearts be troubled. And He says to us this morning, the same thing. Believe. Believe in Him. Trust Him. Know that He knows what He is doing. Now, secondly, Jesus gave them another reason why they shouldn't worry, and that was because He was leaving to prepare a place for them in heaven. He says in verse 2, in my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. Jesus says there was a place in heaven for them. And of course, if you're trusting in Jesus, there is a place in heaven for you as well. Because of what Jesus has done, because He went before us to prepare this place for us, and as we're going to see in just a moment, that place is glorious. You know, as I was thinking about the fact that Jesus went to prepare a place, I couldn't help but think of Keith Green. Uh, who was uh, a Christian uh, songwriter and singer back in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then um, I want to say a tragic accident. I'm sure it wasn't an accident. It was in God's plan that his life would be taken early. So he is with the Lord in glory by his grace. But he said in one of his concerts one time that if the Lord was able to create everything that we see in this world in six days... And he's been working on heaven for 2,000 years or almost 2,000 years. Then he says, what we're living in right here would be a garbage can compared to what's going on in heaven. Well, that's a nice thought. And it is true in a certain sense, but I think Keith really, though he meant well, didn't really understand what Jesus was talking about because Jesus did not go to heaven to build places for us to live. He laid down his life. And He rose again and He ascended into heaven so that we might actually be able to go there. Uh, the Father, when He created heaven, I believe, already created those places, those dwelling places in His house. If Jesus had not gone to the cross, if He hadn't sacrificed Himself, heaven would be closed to us forever. But Jesus went to the cross in order to open the doors of heaven for us so that we could go there. The author to the Hebrews basically tells us about what Jesus did to prepare this place for us. In chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, he says, Therefore it was necessary, he's talking here about the earthly tabernacle and, and um, temple, for the copies of the things in the heavens to be cleansed with these, that is with animal sacrifices, but the heavenly things themselves the heavenly tabernacle, the heavenly temple with better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a holy place made with hands, a mere copy of the true one, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. And then the author to the Hebrews also says in chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, when he talks about the hope that this, that this gives us, that we will see heaven, he says, this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us, having become a high priest forever 
according to the order of Melchizedek. Jesus enters into the heavenly tabernacle there to be our great high priest and to plead his merits on our behalf so that we would enter into heaven. Well, you notice now that Judas is gone. Jesus could speak these words of comfort. Remember, Jesus gave him the, uh, the bread, the morsel dipped in, the, in the, uh, the bowl, and he gave it to him, and he ran out, and they didn't know why he left. But now that he's gone, Jesus begins to direct his comments to them specifically that you are going to be in heaven. Now, I want you to notice, I, I believe he was especially, he was speaking to all of them, but I think he was especially speaking to Peter. If anyone had a reason to be concerned that he wasn't going to see heaven, it might be Peter because they were all about to fall away. The shepherd was going to be struck and the sheep were going to be scattered. They were all basically, in essence, going to deny him to a certain degree. But Peter had been singled out as the one who was going to deny him three times that he even knew him before the sun came up the next day. And I'm sure Peter had in mind here what uh, Jesus had said to them earlier when he was sending them out to teach and preach in the cities. He said this in Matthew 10, verses 32 and 33. Therefore, everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Now, do you think Peter remembered those words when Jesus just told him, you're going to deny me three times? What is this going to mean for Peter? Well, I believe the Lord was telling Peter. I think he was speaking to Peter as much as he was speaking to the other disciples and perhaps even more when he says in our text in verses 1 and 2, do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If it were not so, I would have told you, for I go to prepare a place for you. And that includes Peter. Even though Peter was going to deny Jesus Christ, Jesus was not going to deny Peter. Peter was going to make it. Not because of Peter's love for Christ, that was going to fail, but because of Christ's love for him. Now again, the difference between what Peter was doing and what Jesus was warning us against in Matthew chapter 10 is that Peter did not make a habit of denying Jesus. Remember, after he did it, he was crushed in spirit, and he repented of what he did. And he spent the rest of his life confessing Christ, although he didn't live a perfect life, we know. He was even confronted by Paul on one occasion for being hypocritical. But he really loved him and he really sought to serve him. He did not make a habit of denying Jesus Christ. We may often fail the Lord, and we do often fail the Lord, but we don't plan on failing him. It isn't what we want to do. It is a will against a will, as it were. Uh, we still have sin in ourselves as well as grace in ourselves. Jesus is warned against those who habitually deny him. He will deny them before the Father. Now, another difference is that Peter belonged to Jesus, while those who habitually deny him do not belong to him. Jesus, and this is the point, will never lose his own. Once he saves us, he will keep us. He has prepared a place for us in heaven. When we come in, uh, well, into this relationship with the Father through Jesus Christ, the Father adopts us into his family. We become a part of the family of God. The, the Father, Jesus' Father, becomes our Father. I do want you to notice the particular relational touch that Jesus says here. He doesn't say, in heaven there are many dwelling places, although that is true, but He says, in my Father's house, who is also your Father. When we trust Jesus, we not only become His brothers, but we share the same Father. But here's another thing that's interesting. Our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ goes even beyond that of a brother. Uh, we're not just brothers with Him. When we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we also, as you know very well, become His bride, the bride that He eventually brings to His Father's house. And I think that's what He has reference to here. In my Father's house are many dwelling places. You know, we know in Scripture that that's the way it worked in the Jewish culture, is that when a Jewish man would take a wife, he would bring his wife into his father's house. The father would basically build another room and his son would live there with his wife. 
For instance, in Scripture, when we, we find that when, when it was time for uh, Isaac to marry, that Abraham, in finding him a wife, did not send Isaac to Paddan Aram to find a wife, to take a wife, to build a house, and to live there. But Abraham sent his servant there to bring the wife back for Isaac so that he might live in Abraham's house with him. That's the way it worked. Now, to get a wife for his son, that is, the father, sent, he sent his son into the world. He sent Jesus into the world to lay down his life to redeem his bride, to redeem the church, in order that he might bring her back to his father's house in heaven when her work on earth was finished. Now, Jesus says in his father's house, there are many dwelling places, and those dwelling places are for the bride that Jesus is bringing home to heaven. And I want you to notice the word there, many. What it means is the Father has planned to save many. The Bible tells us so many that they cannot even be counted. And I also want you to know that one of these dwelling places belongs to you if you belong to Jesus, if you have trusted Him. If you have trusted Him, you do belong to Him. And one of those places belongs to you. It may not be the mansion that some of the health and wealth folks are talking about a lot. And really, it wouldn't matter to you a bit whether you were living in a shack or whether you were living in a mansion in heaven as long as you can be there because to be there is, is to be in a world, as we've already seen, of pure delight. So let me just say that if you have not trusted Jesus Christ this morning, I want you to know that this is what He offers to you. If you will only believe in Him, if you will turn from the things that dishonor Him and follow Him. So Jesus says, don't worry, believe. Believe God has a plan. Believe Jesus is in control. Don't worry because He has prepared a place for you in heaven. But finally, He says, they didn't have to worry because He was coming again to take them home. In verse 3, He says, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Now, Jesus has prepared a place in heaven for His disciples. He has prepared a place for all who trust in Him. That includes us if we have trusted in Him. But how are we going to get from here to there? Well, Jesus says, He will come and get us. Now, was Jesus here talking about the second coming? Some people believe that that's what he has in mind, but I do want you to notice he was speaking to his disciples. He says, I am going to come and get you. They died a long time ago, and the second coming still hasn't taken place. So either they're still around here somewhere, you know, buried, uh, or they're with the Lord now, and Jesus was not talking about the second coming. Well, I don't think he was talking about the second coming, even though certainly... Some Christians, um, perhaps many, will go up to be with Jesus at that time. But Jesus did come for His disciples. He just didn't come personally for them, but He did it, as it were, vicariously. He did it by way of messenger. He did it by way of the angels. I think sometimes we, we think that when we die, our souls just sort of immediately spring up into heaven by themselves, and maybe we don't need sort of any intermediary to get us there. But actually, the Bible tells us that there are beings whose responsibility it is to take our souls to be with the Lord in heaven. And that's one of the many ways in which the angels serve the saints. When their work is done in this world, they take their souls to be with the Lord in heaven. Remember, the author to the Hebrews writes regarding the angels in chapter 1, verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent out to render service for the sake of those who will inherit salvation? Yes, that's what they are. Uh, we have angels who serve us because of the Lord's grace. That's the reason why these trials that we're faced with and the difficulties don't absolutely crush us. We have this, the, the angels ministering to us as they minister to Jesus Christ. We have the Holy Spirit bearing our hearts up so that we're not crushed by this load of you know, this anxiety, this burden that's placed upon us. They serve us in many different ways, 
But one of the services they render is bringing the souls of the redeemed home to the Father's house to join the rest of the bride that's already celebrating with Christ in heaven to be joined with Him. Now we read in the parable of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, verse 22. Now the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom, which was in heaven, not in the earth. And the rich man also died and was buried. I think perhaps the angels were involved in carrying his soul to where it went as well. But I do want you to notice Jesus said the angels are the ones who actually do this work. When our work is done in this world, when his calling upon our lives, his purpose for us is finished, the angels will come and take us at that moment that we die. Jesus tells us this morning that we don't have to worry. We simply need to trust. We need to believe that the Father has a good plan. It's the best plan, that He's in control. We need to believe that Jesus is carrying that plan out perfectly. We need to believe that Jesus, when He promised to be with us and to keep us throughout life, that He is, in fact, going to do that. We need to believe that the angels are also with us. We need to believe that even when we fall into sin, even to the point where we would deny Him, that the Lord will never deny us. He went to prepare a place for us in heaven. And the Lord not only knows when we are going to die, He also knows where. And He will have His angels standing by to take us to the Father's house. Now remember, the Father's house is not just a gigantic golden city. Uh, although that might be glorious to look at, uh, I'm sure it's going to be much greater than that. Uh, words would probably fail to describe what heaven is actually like. But we do know this. As Isaac Watts wrote, it is a land of pure delight. In the Father's house, we will be per, you know, perfected. Actually, before we get there, we will be filled with the Holy Spirit beyond what we can... Well, actually, just will be so full that there will be no lack of anything. We'll be filled with joy. We'll be filled with happiness. The Lord will love us and He will cherish us and we will sense that love in a way we've never sensed before, at least to the degree that we will sense it there. And He will grant us these spiritual joys and delights and pleasures and this fullness of love for the rest of time because He loves us, not because of our love for Him, but it's because of His love for us. Our love for Him is simply the result of His love for us. Now, if all these things are going for us, how can we really worry? How can we be anxious? How can we be troubled about anything that happens in this world, knowing that God is in control of these things, He's going to work them together for good, and that eventually He's going to bring us out of this world into heaven? Now, we really can't worry if... We know Him. Really, faith in the Lord has the, the ability, the power, and it's what the Lord intends to dispel all doubts and fears and anything that really clouds the joy that the Lord intends for us. But if we don't know Him, we should worry. We should be afraid. But if you don't know Him, remember this. The Lord offers to save you, and He will save you, and He will take away your fear. And He will take you to heaven if you will only come to Him, if you will forsake your sins and turn to Him. So won't you, if you do not know Him, take Him up on this offer? Because if you do, you can know that the Lord has prepared this place for you and that all these blessings we've just talked about belong to you. Well, I pray by God's grace that you will if you have not done that. Well, let's bow for just a moment of, of prayer. And let's, as we're praying, let's also ask the Lord to prepare us to come to the table, that we might be able to remember that what our Lord Jesus Christ has done, what this represents, is what prepared a place for us in heaven. It's what opened the door for us. This is the reason why we don't have to be troubled, why we don't have to be afraid, because Jesus has endured the only thing that we had to fear, which was God's wrath. He bore it for us so that we would no longer be afraid and troubled, but instead that we might have His joy 
in us. So let's, let's spend a few moments now as we prepare to come and celebrate what Jesus has done.